This is a little bit embarrassing and somewhat humorous, but it's typical me, that in uh, somehow in recording that I normally read all these devotionals, and I think there's seven of them or eight of them. I have a lot of devotionals, but anyways, somehow I misplaced one, so I had to reposition the camera and put it right in front of me because... Uh, I'm going to have to read it off the computer. <laughs> I have to go to the internet to find it. Because it's just my utmost. But it uh, somehow has flown the coop. And we've been kind of debating about whether we should decorate. You know, my wife likes to decorate for Christmas. And, you know, me personally, I'd probably put up a menorah. And that's about it for Hanukkah. And maybe trees. You know, I like to, I don't know. You know, I, I kind of get wrapped up in doing some decorating. Now, I used to do things for everyone else, so that's why I kind of, you know, for myself, I do less. Because, yeah, I put on lots of productions at churches and other things, and, you know, those are fun, you know. You kind of get used to that. And working during the holidays, for me, was always a lot more fun than being at home for the holidays. <laughs> everyone has their own gift. But because of our... Decorations are kind of semi-decorating, and then also because we're planning on moving, and so we're taking out boxes and getting them ready. Oops, I forgot to do that today. I'm supposed to re rebuild my boxes. I have some real sturdy boxes I retake. And start packing for our move that um, I can't find my, my elbows. And I was like, well, hmm. And then what was humorous was that because I'm kind of, sometimes the Lord and I, we get a little groggy and soggy, and I'm kind of like going, it's never, never land. And uh, so I read my, my tozer, and I started talking, and I just kind of meandered all over the universe, it sounded like to me. And I went, I can't record this. I click, shut it off. So then I spent probably 10 or 15 minutes wasted looking for my utmost. <laughs> and it's been raptured. <laughs> so needless to say, this will be interesting doing it this way. But, you know, it brings up a point that a lot of times I think people forget or they seem to take too serious their role or their function in, the, call it the kingdom of God, that somehow they have to, they think they have to be so perfect or they put a, together some kind of perfect presentation like, you know, fancy websites or, you know, I mean, the first thing I do is that if I see some kind of, you know, schlick, you know, really schlick shtick is what we used to call it. If I see something that's really well produced and all fancy and everything else, I go behind the scenes and look and see where it's coming from because I don't trust all the, you know, upfront stuff because I was one of those guys that used to set up, you know, the facades and make it all look good. And then behind the scenes, <laughs> oh boy, behind the scenes you see reality. And, you know, God wants us to be who we are, as we are, the way we are. And so that's why I've always on video, or video devotionals, been, and tried to be as real as I could be. You know, I'm starting a new series called Wives Tales. You know, I get a chance with my wife to share that, you know, to say, hey, look, you know, pastors are people too. They succeed and they fail. They make uh, good transitions and do things sometimes looking very spiritual but upright and sometimes they turn around and they look like the most stupid you know carnal Christian in the world no offense to you pastors but come on now guys I've been around you <laughs> spilled beans oh no I'm gonna be banned <laughs> but you love them anyways you know I mean I've had in my lifetime some of the most inspiring people you know that I've been the privilege to be around, you know, and at the same time pray for. And sometimes I've been some of the most challenging that I've ever seen in my life, wondering, God, how can you possibly use that person? And um, if he could use me, you know, he could use anybody else. And, you know, thank God he does, because otherwise we'd all be condemned to hell, which technically we are, but God saved us and spared us. Why? I'm not sure. But in so doing, because he has, then we should not be so contentious 
meaning fighting each other, and pretentious, meaning full of pride, that we can't humble ourselves and learn to be maybe a little more forgiving, a little more loving, a little more graceful. Because if love covers a multitude of sins, if you really want to cover some of the garbage that you really are, then learn to love more. And maybe you'll look bad less. You know, I mean, in other words, a lot of your faults will be forgiven if you love more. People tend to respond to love, and then God likewise seems to honor by covering a multitude of sins if you're a loving person. So, if you choose to love, which is what you can do. I mean, it's not about, you know, oh, I feel in love. <laughs> yeah, right, sure you do. <laughs> Tell that to your wife. <laughs> but, or husband. But, in reality, if you love as God loved, which was a choice. God didn't have to come to the world, you know, and die for our sins. He could have taken care of it, just snapped a finger and wiped us all out. Instead, he identified. That's the interesting part, is that part of this Christmas season isn't just about glad tidings of great joy, which should be unto all people, but that he identified with us. You know, I don't know if you really grasp this yet. God, who's bigger than we are, greater than we ever imagined, you know, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so too are his thoughts higher than our thoughts and his ways beyond our understanding and comprehension. And if you think you got to figure it out, I don't think so. Same mistake the Jews made. Wrong. You're making a mistake. Because God's ways have so much more we only understand in part. There's so much more of His part we don't comprehend. And that's where we come to the place of we should do what we understand to do and what simplicity he gives us, which is to love. So when we do love like he has told us to, then he, on his part, can take care of the part we don't understand, which is to forgive us and to, you know, take us the way we are, as messed up as we are, and as kind of screwed up in the head as we are, and how we have all these weird ideas about God. And then somehow put it into a nice little package and say, okay, I accept it. Done. You mean I gotta love that idiot over there because he's in it too? And them over there? But you see, if God took care of it, then we don't have to do anything about it. But to respond to it in love and acceptance of grace and mercy. So when Jesus identified with us, that's amazing because he didn't have to. He chose to. Didn't have to, but chose to. So because he chose to, that means we have a freedom of choice to make our own decision. Do we want to be like Jesus and choose to love someone that is unlovely, even as we were unlovely and he chose to love us? Or are we going to identify with our own self-righteousness and say, no, we don't want that person saved? You see, it's pretty easy to be a saint, you know. Do you realize that you're really a sinner in disguise? And the reality of all your sainthood is all wrapped up in one person. Jesus. And it's wrapped up in what he did. Not what we've become. Not who we are. And really not much about anything that we possibly could do. Yeah, I think... I think that when Jesus said that we need to love, you know... Our enemies? I don't think he was kidding. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. But maybe I'm right. Now in utmost, since I don't have the book, that they may be one just as we are one. John 17.22 Personality is the unique, limitless part of our life that makes us distinct from everyone else. It is too vast for us even to comprehend. An island in the sea may be just the top of a large mountain, and our personality is like that island. We don't know the great depths of our being, therefore we cannot measure ourselves. We start out thinking we can, but soon realize that there is really only one being who fully understands us, and that is literally our Creator. 
Personality, though, is the characteristic mark of the inner spiritual man, just as individuality is the characteristic of the outer natural man. So think about that. Personality is that part of the inner person, and individuality is that part of the outer person. Get it? Our Lord can never be described in terms of individuality and independence, but only in terms of his total person. In other words, when you define Jesus, you define the Father, because he said, I and my Father are one, John 10.30. Personality merges, and you can only reach your true identity once you are merged with another person. When love, or the Spirit of God, comes upon a person, he is transformed. He becomes different and unique. He becomes special. He becomes that part with which God designed him to be, a vessel for his spirit to come upon him, a vessel of honor and not a vessel of wrath. Our Lord never referred to a person's individuality or his isolated positions, but spoke in terms of the total person. That they may be one just as we are one is what he prayed for his disciples. He did not lay hands upon each one and pray for the individuality of their peculiar needs and persona, personifications of personas that they were, but rather he prayed that they all may be one, as he is one. Uh-oh, that don't look good, does it? Once your rights to yourself are surrendered to God, ooh, I knew that was coming, your true personal nature begins responding to God immediately. Jesus Christ brings freedom to your total person. Even your individuality is transformed. The transformation is brought about by love, personal devotion to Jesus. Love is the overflowing result of one's person in true fellowship with another. In other words, you can't be in Jesus and not love, and you can't love or not love the brethren and be in Jesus. That's what First John was trying to say all along. You have to find out for yourself that if you're not loving someone, like say you pick President Obama or Oprah Winfrey or I don't know, Joel Osteen or Rick Warren or Greg Laurie or Billy Graham, and you say, of any of those, I don't love them. Eh, not. Then you can't say that Jesus is in you. Because you can't not love. You have to love as he has loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So you're acting outside of God's will. When you say, no, I don't love them. I want them to go to hell. <laughs> or whatever it is that you're messed up in your mind about. Because the reality is, you were called, chosen, filled with the Holy Spirit to bless and not curse, to cause a desire of that other person to want to be like what you have inside of you, which is love. Love causes men, the love of God causes men or draws men to repentance. It causes them to turn around. They quit being violent and they choose to be nonviolent. They quit being angry and they choose to be loving. They quit being divisive, and they choose to be submissive. They want to completely be with that nature of love and that fountain spring that comes out from a bunch of people all together in love. The hippies knew it. It worked. We all had love. And we had kumbaya moments. Well, God wants more than a kumbaya moment. He wants a kumbaya life. He wants a Yahweh, or Yahweh, really, is what it is, because it's a Yud and a Ve, but He wants a Yahweh life in you. A kumbayave, you know, if you want to play with words. He wants to bring together in himself and make you one with me and us one with him. So that we would no longer be talking about ourselves, but we would be talking about us as we are one with him. Because if you, if you find yourself separating along lines of denomination or, you know, certain references that you don't like, you know, you're going to find yourself in a problem with First John and, and what Jesus said, literally himself, in John 17, 22. So, 
I don't know what to tell you about where you want to draw the line and say, I'm not of them. Or you want to say, like Daniel said in his prayer, we have sinned. We have fallen away. We need forgiveness. Because if Jesus identified with you before you knew him and took your sin upon himself, then don't you think that that's what we're called to do? That we take, say, President Obama's sin or Oprah's or Rick Warren's or anybody's sin, whoever it is that you think isn't forgiven, whatever, that we take upon ourselves their sin because as we do, we accept to pray for their forgiveness, their mercy, their grace, and we pray that they may be one with us so that God could make them one with us. Because once they start loving us and we love them, they will be drawn to repentance and to turn to God with their heart and soul and mind and strength. So you see, it's really not about all these other things you got problems with, you know, theology, and whatever, you know, doctrine, and dogma, and, you know, hermeneutic and homiletic and drash and interpretation, and segregation and <laughs> separation and all the other things that you want to play with. But it's all about what God is because God in a person changes the outward person to become one with himself. That's how it works. It's simple, really, but you have to do it in a very challenging way for some of you. I'll admit, it's not so easy, even though it's going to sound easy. All you got to do is love. <laughs> Good luck with that one. I don't think some of you really want to love some of the people that God is telling you to love. And you know what? He may put them right in front of your face and challenge you in the political arena, challenge you in the emotional arena, challenge you in the physical arena, and challenge you in the sexual arena. To discover and for you to uncover where it is that you really aren't a Christian yet. And that you really haven't let go and let God. That you really are a carnal Christian inside. And that he wants to take that inside out. And then begin to look at it and remove it from you. As only he can. But you know how he does it? The same way that you would do it to someone else. If you're walking with God. You just love the person. And they choose out of love to not be that criminal.